Bolly and tonic water calms the nerves. Joseph Sisko chills some tube grubs for Nog, and Captain Sisko forgot all about Nephi Beaumont as soon as Zoe Phillips moved into the neighborhood. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are also joined by a very special guest, Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf, writer. And uh, it is a Nog episode, by the way. Melissa hey. Longo joins us. <laughs> uh, my name is Ryan T. Husk. Today we are doing a review of Deep Space Nine Season 4, Paradise Lost, directed by Reza Badiyi. Is it Reza? Reza. Okay. Written by Iris Stephen Bear and Mr. Robert Hewitt Wolf. This is going to be a great one. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Doing well. Doing really good. What an episode. Mm, 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 mm. So much to talk about. Um, yeah. Hey, Sirach, by the way, real quick, I have a surprise for you. Check this out. So uh, we have some friends over at uh, Spitfire Labs that emailed us and said, hey, we're big fans of your show. We want to send you guys something awesome. Uh, we'll talk about it more, I think, in a couple weeks might be better. But check this out. Oh, oh nice. wow. Look at the freaking wow. detail <laughs> on this. Wow, that's pretty cool. It even has Klingon writing. Nice. This one says wow. Warriors in Five. That's a wow. basketball uh, playoffs. War, 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 warriors in warriors five. In five yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Steph, look, Steph Curry on the back. And look at this. <laughs> yeah. Look at this. No. Oh, yeah. It even has the Klingon symbol yeah, in the middle. It's very this nice. is metallic. Oh, wow. It sticks on with uh, wow. with uh, magnets. Wow. And on the that back. Let me show you the back real quick, and then we'll get right back to this. But it, I was just so blown away by this. Holy! Nice. Oh. Wow. So we nice. each got one, Sirach. That's um, dope. I'll show you what yours looks like right now. Holy! <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let so you open pretty. that. <laughs> we'll, we'll do uh, anyway, um, everybody at home, we will uh, kind of go into a little more detail, for, probably in a couple weeks when we do the Sons of Moog. I think that's a great episode to kind of get into that, but they are Spitfire Labs. You can find them Spitfire Labs on Twitter. Also spitfirelabs.nyc, I believe is their website. We'll include it in the description box below. Um, anybody that wants to get it, just type in seventh rule 15 and you get 15% off of anything. Dude, I spent like almost an hour looking at their website. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I, I, I hate how amazing it is and how talented artists are. It's unbelievable, it's unreal. But we'll talk about it more in a couple of weeks. Just go in the description box below and buy amazing stuff. Let's talk about Paradise Lost. Wow. Thank you, Spitfire. That was, that's awesome. It's a, it's a uh, husband and wife team, by the way, that does everything. So it's nice. just, it's beautiful. Can't wait to talk more about it. Yeah, the detail is amazing. Um, speaking of which, the detail in this episode is pretty amazing. I, I, was, I was watching this episode. It, it felt like a movie to me. Yeah. Uh, it's just that good. There's so much to talk about and so much to cover. The performances, first of all, I thought were A1 in this episode. Love the acting between um, Cisco and Admiral Lay Layton. Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. You know what I noticed, too, was that the, the main, the kind of the main characters in this, besides Layton and a little bit of uh, Ben Teen and Jarish Inyo, you know, but the kind of the, the Deep Space Nine team was Cisco and Odo. Jake and Nog and Joseph Sisko. And they carried the whole thing basically, you know, besides the the other a little bit characters. of stuff on the Defiant. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Just beautiful. Great stuff. So Robert, yeah. uh, you uh, this is always really great to bring up because you are the son of a man who was in the military. So I always picture whenever there's kind of like these military things, I feel like a lot of this came from you throwing ideas out or they're asking, they say, what do they do in the military? And there was basically what amounts to be a false flag situation where they created this false flag. And I wanted to know if that was something where that came from, if that came from a, a historical event or just it was a good you know, plot device. I think, mo I think a lot of that was actually from Ron, Fair, mm -hmm. you know, uh, credit where credit is due. Uh, he has the story credit on it. 
And I think he might have thought of some of the, the mechanism for the false flag and how that was all going to work. Um, and I think that's where it all came from. I mean, the stuff I would learn by my dad was more like, you know, just the, the sort of ceremony, like how people would address each other, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, Starfleet plays by its own rules too. So that wasn't strictly speaking, like, you know, always in military traditions, but, but I, I feel like Ron came up with this story. I can't remember how it all came together, but I feel like Ron came up with the basic idea for the false flag and all that stuff. And then Ira and I kind of took it and ran with it and turned it into the two-parter, mm. which is why Ron has credit as for story on the second part. Correct. Yeah, I just checked. You're right. That's exactly yeah. it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that stuff, the mechanism and Red Squad and all that stuff, I think came from Ron. But it's been a while. <laughs> When in doubt, I'll give credit to someone else, though. You know, <laughs> why not? Um, you know, when you're writing for Cisco, um, he takes these very strong positions uh, on his belief system and the things that he's willing to fight, essentially till death. Uh, you know, what, I just kind of want to know about the process of, of getting to that point with him and creating that, like making that the pillar of his, his, you know, uh, his stance. Look, I think, you know, I think we talked about this a little bit before where characters are really like a collaboration between the writers and the actors in, in so far as like, even if it's not a formal collaboration, even if it's just like we wrote this for him and did a great job with it and seemed to really respond to it. So we'll write some more things like that, you know, um, or we wrote this for him and it didn't play that well, you know, Maybe we won't write those things for him anymore, um, which was rare, obviously, but occasionally happened. But the, I think in the case of him being such a sort of like fierce and committed to his to his values and, um, you know, like a, a sort of a charge ahead, get things done kind of guy. I think that that was. Definitely informed by Avery as we went along, you know, I think. Michael's original idea for Cisco was a guy who was a little more hesitant and a little more unsure of himself in certain situations. And you can sort of see that in Emissary. But by season four, I think the character had grown. And I think we'd also sort of grown in matching that character to the th kind of things that Avery just hit out of the park all the time, you know? Um, and the, yeah. and the, he hit this one out of the park. Family stuff, you know, that, yeah. that strong leadership stuff. Um, the guy who can be like an uh, do it my way. This is how we're doing it, kind of guy on the uh, in ops, and then invite everybody over for dinner. You know what I mean? That to us was, mm -hmm. was a lot of who Cisco was, and so when he's and that th this episode shows both sides of that, right? When he's dealing with the security issues, he's one way. When he's dealing with his father and with his son, right? Yeah, and even and even a little bit with Nog. He's another, although with Nog, he tended to, to go back to that sort of commander, captain person. There was definitely a point where he puts Nog, he reminds Nog what the situation is. <laughs> He's like, let me, yeah. let me, wait, what, what does he say, Melissa? I don't know if you remember the scene where he says, uh, he says, I think you're under the mistaken impression that I was asking for a favor. <laughs> I want names and I, I want a name and I want it now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I like that. I, I like that fine line that they have to walk between <laughs> being comfortable with each other and, you know, friendly, but you're also superior officer and cadet. So those lines can get blurred sometimes, but then it's like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, he's my <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, he, he, well, he may <laughs> hang out with you at his dad's restaurant, but, but you know, <laughs> when it's time yeah. for stuff to get done, you better do it. <laughs> yeah that's the I, stuff i think came a little bit more from from my dad was like you know i was not asking you a favor you know <laughs> i'm your dad you're going to do this thing now you know <laughs> that kind of thing and cisco has a way I, sorry i was just gonna no, say no. and avery has a way of like when he gets into that level his voice changes you know yeah. it goes from this to more of a Boom, kind of. It's almost like operatic, you know what I mean? Like it just changes. Uh, but anyway, what were you saying, Saron? 
No, I'm agreeing with you. And I, I, he ended that statement that you made with understood, Mr. Nog. And I, and I like the idea of calling him Mr. Nog, which I just, uh, you know, it's the way he said it. It just had so much texture in there. Um, but the scenes between them are great. And the other thing that Avery did in this episode, I thought really well, was play the psychological game with the, with the Red Squad interrogation. Oh, um, brilliant great. scene. That was so. That was so Star Trek, right there. Right, where he basically walks him into revealing everything that he was saying, and uh, I love the way you guys wrote that. I just felt like it. It just it played so well, and it, it was believable because he seemed to have known more than what he did, right? And that's how they kind of use these uh, interrogations when the police are interrogating a criminal. They they let them know that they know something. Right but you got to tell me the rest, right? Yeah. Yeah, the guy in the other room already told me yeah. everything, so yeah, you might exactly. as well just admit it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a prisoner's dilemma, right? The first one to talk is the one who gets off easy. Yeah. Nowadays, of course, you wouldn't have to interrogate him because he would have live, live streamed the entire coup. <laughs> In real time, right? In real time. You would have like, Snapchatted the, just, him yeah, sabotaging yeah, the, snap the light. Yeah, Snapchat and see him sabotaging the power grid. <laughs> Would have, the whole thing would be on parlor. <laughs> yeah, and, and speaking of that, I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the things that I think uh, DS9 really stands the test of time on, and that is these themes that still resonate. Like, I'm watching this episode, and it feels like it was pulled out of the headline today in some way, and it's, I don't know how you guys do that so well. It's, it's kind of remarkable. Uh, I know you say you don't have a magic ball, and you don't have, you know, you're not looking into the future. But it but, keeps happening. But it keeps it keeps freaking <laughs> happening. And well, we're looking. Here's the trick: like we're not looking at the future; we're looking at the past. Exactly. And the sad right. thing is, this crap just keeps coming back, you know. Or we're looking right. at the present of the time. I mean, what was this? Twenty five years ago. So that was ninety six. Ninety six. January eighth, nineteen ninety six was when this came out. So you guys wrote it, obviously ninety yeah. five. Yeah. You know, we we were in the middle of the Clinton administration, so things weren't too messy. Uh, we're not at that time of the administration, but I mean, there was plenty of like, you know, we were mm -hmm. looking more at the fifties, you know, we were looking at the sort of like, right. You know, the, the, the witch hunts, the McCarthyism, the, the, you know, premature anti-fascism as they, as they uh, called the people who were against Hitler before world war two, you know, that whole kind of like, fear of spies and fifth columnists and stuff like that. So we were just, we were looking at history. And, and as I think I said in the last pod, uh, podcast, I think it, you know, it, it felt very scarily relevant in like 2001, 2002, 2003, you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and now it feels relevant again. And, and that's just, I think, the cyclical nature of history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, was there a particular person that Admiral Layton was based off? Because I, I noticed that. Ooh, good question. That's juicy. Hmm. Kind of. Was... I I don't think there really was anyone in particular. I think you know. Yeah, I can't think of anyone in particular that we based him off of. I mean, I think it was just sort of this idea of we wanted to make Layton. Layton's the hero of his own story, right? Mm -hmm. You know. Leighton is that it believes he's doing the right thing. And that I feel like always makes for the scariest villains in some ways, because you could almost see his point, you know, he kind of had a point of view and that was really where we were coming from was trying to create this guy who uncompromising does what he thinks is best all the time. And there's a danger in that, right? There's a danger that you go off the, off the deep end if you're like that. And that's part of what makes your writing so great in Star Trek as a whole is we never see a villain that's just one dimensional. We never see, a, very rarely see a villain where you can't, you can't at least see where they're coming from, where you're like, okay, they're the bad guy, but at least I understand what their motivation is, you know? That was really important to us mm -hmm. was, you know, to try to make sure that we understood where all the characters were coming from all the time. I mean, I, I think there are some definitely some characters who are like one offs in one episode who don't seem to be particularly deep, you know, and maybe they have a scene or two uh, and maybe they're just the villain for like an episode. 
Mm. But I think most of the time, especially when we were going to go for these bigger, juicier roles, like a two-parter or someone who might recur, we, we definitely try to dig into their psychology. And I know Melissa right now is thinking, what about Kai Wynn? She sucks all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you yeah. can see where she's coming from. Yeah, she, you know. She's, you know she's always self-serving, but she thinks that she's, she uh, too is the hero of her own story. And she wants to be the hero of everyone's story, <laughs> you know. So. Whether you like it or not. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think there was a line where um, Avery uh, Cisco said, uh, oh, yeah, and the answer is you. And I think it always comes down to with these kinds of people where they're the, they are the only answer to the, the problem, right? You need me. It's my ideas. I'm the solution. Um, whether it's Kai Wynn or, or this uh, Admiral Lee. Yeah. Look, right. there's, a, there's an instinct in human nature, the, the sort of um, the strongman instinct or the, you know, the, the white knight, you know, often a white dude uh, in our culture, but a guy who comes in and has all the answers and sort of like is going to fix things and, you know, drive things through and make everyone safe and make America great again or whatever the fucking line is, you know, and, and we have a, I think, um, a predisposition to respond well to that. And that's a danger. You know, we want daddy to come and make everything, make everything. Okay. You know, I think there's a very primal instinct to that. And that can be really, really dangerous when it comes to leadership. And I think that that's kind of what, Leighton embodies is that kind of, you know, big man savior in his own mind, but also mm. look in the minds of all the people who are following him. He wasn't doing this by himself, you know, that he had, he had co-conspirators people who thought, you know, he had the answers and, and, and stand the torpedoes and full speed ahead. And right. And that's why dangerous. it was so important when they they when they realized hey, everybody that's a part of this has served with him before. So they were loyal to him. He knew he could trust them. He could say, hey, remember how I got you through that nebula situation back in the day? And you trusted me. And now you have to trust me again. And they're like, you're right. <laughs> Julius Caesar, right? I mean, that's who he thinks he is, right? In a way, like the guy who's going to save Rome from itself um, and from its enemies. But in doing so, destroys everything that you know matters about Rome. You know, destroys the Republic to save it, um, and that's kind of where he's coming from. Look, he—that's why he brings in Cisco, right? He thinks Cisco. He thinks he's going to win Cisco over too, same as he won over Bettine, Bettine and all the other Bettine, people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and all the other people. You know, and it totally reminds me of another Star Trek episode in next generation it has a similar dilemma and everybody that's watching right now in the chat in the live chat what does that dilemma remind you of from the next generation there's an episode where an officer has to choose between his or her loyalty to a superior or to a greater cause um that episode to me that it reminded me of i believe was called pegasus and it was Riker, uh some an admiral comes along that was uh, Riker's captain back in the day, and um, Riker remains loyal to him anyway. And Picard is kind of stuck in the middle to where Riker and the admiral aren't telling Picard what's going on. And Riker has to choose, are you loyal to this previous admiral and the chain of command, or are you gonna stick with your gut or something like that? And I was kind of wondering, um, and it's a great episode, uh, Robert, did you have much knowledge of the next generation or of original series when you got brought on to write Deep Space Nine? Was there kind of like a blueprint that you guys kind of followed or? I mean, they... certainly, you know, every one of us had seen every episode of the, of the original series many times, you know, I, I was raised on it pretty much. Um, and then uh, Next Generation, you know, because I wrote that one episode for Next Generation, I, I watched it eagerly when it first came on, and then I sort of fell off. Which episode was it? I wrote Fistful of Datas, which oh, was season yes. five? Wow. I think so. It was my first job. So, so when, I, when I got invited to pitch, I, I, I got back on the horse, and they were rerunning uh, Next Generation episodes at midnight on the local 
in local syndication. So I would stay up till midnight every night. And luckily between when I got invited to pitch, and when I went into pitch, I had like a month and a half. And then between the time when I sold the story and when I had to actually start working, I had a few more months because the way things fell out. So for like five, six months, I just watched next generation every night before bed. And you know, it gotten way better than when I'd stopped. I stopped watching because <laughs> I was in grad school and I didn't have time, you know, and, and, uh, and I was like, you know, doing my projects and my own scripts and I just had no time. And so when I went back to it, I was like, oh, wow, this has gotten so much better. You know, and I think I remember Pegasus being a good one. Um, there were just a bunch of them, like season three, even season two, Drumhead. I think it was maybe even that might have been season one. But like once I started watching again, I was like, oh, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. And then obviously, you know, Ron and Renee came over from Next Generation and, and Ira did a year on Next Generation. And so did mm. Pete. Uh, so we always had people who who come off the next generation on the show. Michael, obviously. Um, I don't know if it was a template, but it was certainly like uh, sh- standing on the shoulders of giants type thing. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. we knew what had come before and it was a strong foundation to sort of do our own thing on top of. Right. It's just really amazing how you guys were able to have part of it was was previous Star Trek voice that we recognize and we know and love, but also go in a completely different direction in tonality and theme. Uh, That's why to this day, I still think Deep Space Nine is the best written series. Thanks. I mean, look, there's a spectacular writing in all of the shows and Next Generation and the original series had some terrific writing. And, you know, we always thought of ourselves in some ways as being like, trying to be a spiritual successor more even to the original series than to next generation because next mm. generation sort of did its own thing and we we sort of tried to lean into some of the more sort of character struggling through real dilemma type stuff that was always part of next uh, original series and to the next generation too but it was a little more conflict than original series i think it might be fair to say between the various people in the show and so we sort of leaned into that i think that was sort of our, our thought anyway. Well, uh, we're going to take a super quick break here, um, and then we're going to get way more into this episode. Really, really a good, great, fun, amazing episode. And uh, we will come right back on the seventh rule. 